Hey everybody, so here is our first tutorial for doing 3D graphics in Max. Um, what's one of the really nice things about this is a lot of the stuff that we learned for doing sound is going to directly carry over to working in graphics. So the learning curve is not going to be as steep. But on the downside, there are a lot of complexities to doing graphics in any multimedia environment, and certainly Max is no exception, particularly because we're going to start with three-dimensional graphics, which always adds a layer of complexity, but also uh, really gets us into interesting territory very quickly. Now, one thing I should say before I get started in the tutorial, I finally come to realize why uh, the tutorials are not working as well as they could, because despite my encouragement, a lot of you are watching the tutorials and not, in fact, doing the tutorials, or not doing them to the depth that's necessary. Maybe you'll do some of it, but not do all of it. So for the rest of the semester, what I'm going to do is ask that you do the tutorial and build on your own exactly what I build in the tutorial, bring it to class, and you'll actually email it as part of your quiz in class project. So uh, I really need you with all of these tutorials to, to do them and come to class with the file that shows that you've done them, and I will be checking those. And I think that that will help because just watching the tutorial is 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 not is not enough. In fact, it's just watching the tutorial I think is a waste of time. If you're not going to sit there and do it while you watch it, then um, then there isn't actually a point in watching it. Possibly there's a point in watching it later after you've already done it to refresh your memory. Um, but even then, I'm not sure if it's worth doing. Uh, if it's worth just watching the tutorial uh, rather than doing it. So let's get started with this uh, exciting new material. First of all, the first thing we need is a graphics window. And that we create using the Hmm. You're not working. Why not? It's very odd. Unlock my patch. There we go. Okay. Jit dot window. And so this JIT, this uh, jitter, this is a class of objects in Max that deal with video. And uh, a, a window needs a name. I'll call it my world. And I'm going to introduce a new concept, which is typed in attributes. Uh, so I'm going to type in the attribute at floating, and then give it an argument after a space of one. So my total object here is jit.window space my underscore world space at floating one. And here it is. There's my jit.window. You see it's named my world. And we see that it is floating, meaning if I click on this window, my world doesn't fall behind. Without floating, without floating one, it still creates a window. But then as soon as I click here, this, this window will come to the front, and my world, the jit.window, will fall to the back. It's still there. So if I move this, there it is. It's still under there. But it's not, since it's not floating on top, it's easy to lose. So I like the at floating. And see, it auto completes this at floating one. And of course, this one is a Boolean value at floating true, at floating yes, at floating one. And here's our window. Now, just for your. Uh, um, information, this is a general purpose video window. So if I take any video file at all and drag it into my Max window and connect it to this window, lock my patcher and play it, the video will play to the window. It's a general purpose video window. Once again, how I did that was, let me show you the finder component. I just took a video clip, 
dragged it into Max, and it became automatically this player object that then I can connect up to the video window, turn on looping, hit play, and it just plays into the window. We're using the window slightly differently in this case. So let's take a look at some other things we can do with this window. Um, with the at Rui, we can attach an at Rui and take a look. There are a lot of attributes that um, that we can use with the JIT dot window. Uh, one that we're definitely going to want to use is FSAA, which stands for Full Screen Anti-Aliasing. This is going to create a much smoother look to our graphics. Um, another one that is very useful is Full Screen, which allows us to go full screen with our window. But don't click it right now, because if you click it right now and you go full screen, there's no way to get back. So we're going to need to create a different way to go full screen and get back. And also, you see how this attribute, at floating one, I could also get to that here, floating. right? If I wanted to turn on and off floating. But I put it in as a typed in attribute because I always want to leave floating on. So I don't need it as another attribute cluttering up the screen. So let's take a look at a new object, which is the key object. The key object is exactly like the um, the rule when actor receives event key in Game Salad. It's exactly the same thing. What it does, it reports a little bit differently. When we hit a key, it gives us the ASCII number of that key. So when I hit A, it tells me 97. When I hit capital A, it tells me 65. When I hit B, 98, C, 99. And if I want to see what the key is in Max, I can use A, T, O, uh, excuse me, I, T, O, A, integer to ASCII. And that is going to, if I use the right inlet of a message box, that'll show me what key is being hit. A is 97, B is 98. C is 99. Um, you don't need to use the ITOA. You can really just hook up a key and a number box, whack a key, H, and say, oh, H is 104. OK. But if we use this in combination with select, I can do something in response to a keystroke. And what I typically do is use the escape key. which is key number 27, to bang a toggle that that's then connected to my full screen here. Um, so that when I want to enter full screen, I hit escape and I go full screen. And when I want to leave full screen, I hit escape again and I leave full screen. Uh, also, you might have noticed that when I went full screen, the menu bar didn't go away. That's actually another attribute of jit.window full screen menu bar. If I turn that off when I go full screen, I get the whole screen. Whereas with FS menu bar, it keeps the menu bar when I go full screen. So really, you could probably add to this an at FS menu bar zero. So the default setting for your jit.window could be jit.window name floating one, so it always stays on top, FS menu bar zero, so that when we do go full screen, we don't have this menu bar still on the screen. So that's our output section. That's our screen. Um, so let's take a look at the next thing we need, which is a renderer. Since we're dealing with 3D graphics, we're basically making uh, a world populating it with objects, putting a virtual camera in that world, and then rendering the scene as that camera sees it. So that object is jit.gl.render, and uh, it has to match the name of the window. So my underscore world.
and you can just memorize this structure. Q metro, which is the same as the metro object. Every so often it presses a button. The difference is that Q metro is going to let some button presses go if the computer is getting too strained because graphics, uh, you know, rendering graphics can be extremely uh, computationally intensive. So Q metro uh, tries, in this case, uh, every 33 milliseconds, it tries to send a bang every 33 milliseconds, but if it can't, Rather than stress out the computer, it skips a bang, um, which you don't want to do in music because then you don't hear the beat. But if, if that just means losing one frame of video so the computer's not stressed out, it's fine. And then uh, this Qmo Metro is actually sending two messages. It's sending the erase message, causing the, uh, the, the rendering to be cleared, and then a bang, a button press, causing the next frame to be rendered. You don't need this button here, but I just added it there to make it explicit that first it's erasing, then it's redrawing. And uh, there's lots of attributes for your attrui. The one that I think is most important, and that, I mean, there's really a ton of them, um, is uh, the erase color, because that is the color that your background is going to be once the metro is turned on. So if I want a white background, I choose a white erase color here. If I wanted a pink background, I choose a pink erase color here. So now we have all the basic components. We have a renderer and we have a window where we can see the scene that's being rendered. So the next thing we need is a camera. This is jit.gl.camera. And the, uh, you see the jit.jit.dot .jit .dot that I mentioned when we talked about jit.window, that is the larger class of video-related objects. And then gl um, is the specific set of objects that deal with 3D graphics. So anything that's jit.gl means it's a video object, that specifically deals with three-dimensional rendering. So jit.gl.camera, and here we want a typed-in attribute of tripod1. This means our virtual camera will act as if it's on a tripod. And then mostly what we're doing with our camera is connecting several attributes because the camera has a position in 3D space and it also has a position that it pointed at. And those are two distinct things. Think about a real camera. A real camera can be somewhere. It can be 10 feet to my right. And it can be looking at something that's unrelated to its position. It could be looking at me. It's 10 feet to my right. It's looking at me. So a camera has both a position in 3D space and a look at. And these are in meters in x, y, z coordinates, or left, right, up, down, back, forth. So this is a camera that's two meters away from the center of our world in the z-plane, and it's looking at the center of our world, 0, x, 0, y, 0, z. So two meters away from the center, looking at the center. And we can also, we also have a very useful um, attribute called lock look, which when it's enabled means we keep the camera pointed at the same point in space even if the camera moves. So now the camera's 10 meters away, but it's, but it's, it's locked looking at 000. zero, zero. Um, so it enables us to do a tracking shot, if you will. Okay, so perfect. We've got, we've got a renderer, we've got a window, we've got a camera, um, and as in any good scene, we need a light. That's jit.gl.light. 
Um, oh, and also the camera should reference the world, my world, as should the light, my world. And the type of light we're going to talk about at type point, a point light source, basically a, a dot a bright dot that radiates in all directions. And here again, it's a lot about the attributes. Um, we want to be able to draw bounds so we can see where our light is. There's our light. We want to be able to position the light And we want to be able to control its color, which in this case will be its diffuse color. So now we've put a light into our scene. So now we need to put an object into our scene. What kind of objects do we have? Well, our simplest object is the jit.gl.grid shape. And of course, we want it to be in our world. Because we could have multiple worlds going on here. Right now, we only have one, but we could have multiple 3D worlds. Um, and there's a couple at attributes that you just always want to type in. Um, at lighting enable, at smooth shading, and at depth enable. Those are three basic attributes that you can just always type in. And you see how these, these are all separated by spaces, and they make for really long object names. When working in OpenGL, I just squish my object down, or working, I should say, working in, yeah, 3D graphics in Max, which is GL, OpenGL. I just squish my objects down so that they read this way, um, rather than reading like a long line of text. I find that an easier more manageable uh, way to work with the objects. And we can see, there's my sphere. Uh, it's a sphere by default, um, but as always, I can go in here and change the shape to torus. That's a donut shape. I'm going to move my camera back a little bit. Do, 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 do cylinder, cube, and of course I have position, and now there's several ways to rotate objects in three-dimensional space. I find rotate x, y, z to be the easiest because you're rotating, uh, this is the rotations in degrees, so here I'm rotating on the x-axis. The x-axis is the horizontal axis. So you can imagine the, um, the x-axis as like a rotisserie skewer that's going through my object, and I'm rotating on that axis. Uh, or if I put a skewer from top to bottom on the y-axis, then I rotate on that axis. If I put a skewer from front to back and rotate on that axis, that's my z rotation. So there's other ways to think about rotation in 3Space, but uh, we're going to stick with rotate x, y, z as our way to, to deal with rotation. And of course, positioning 0, 0, 0 is the center of our world. I can move to the right, move to the left, move down, move up, and move away or towards. And of course, it's all interacting with my light, because my light, if I draw bounds, I can see my light is right here at position 1, 1, 1. So I can change my light's position and we see that the shading of the faces of the cube is altered. And obviously if I change the color of my light, the color of the cube will be altered. Move my light up, now my light is above, now my light is below. Now my light is behind the cube, 
So the cube is in silhouette. Now my light is above it, and now my light is in front of it. And of course, this, this, this bounding box for the light is a little ugly, so we just want it there as a reference when we don't need it anymore. We turn off draw bounds. So now we have a three-dimensional world with an object in it, and we can move our camera closer and further. We can move our camera up and down. We can uh, let me put this object back in the center. We can look at a certain point and lock our look so that as the camera moves around, it continues pointing at the same point in space. Or I can, as the camera moves, have it point at new locations so that objects pass out of view as the camera moves. And of course, to add more objects, I can just duplicate. Option, click, and drag. And now I have another object on the scene. There it is. I have a sphere and a cube now. And option, click, and drag. And now I have a torus on the scene as well. And I can fly above them, fly to the right or to the left, change the color of my light, move my light around. And I'm already interacting with relatively few objects here in my scene with, um, with a, you know, a fairly complex 3D world. So what's next? Well, there's a couple of things that we can't do at the moment. Um, for instance, we can't really do anything without having to click and drag on these tons of attributes we have. How do we get around that issue? Well, fortunately, we already know an object that helps us out in this situation. We already know the line tilde object from our work with sound. But since we're not working with sound, we're just working with floating point values, we can use the regular line, no tilde. It takes two arguments. The first argument is any floating point number that instructs it we want it to output floating point numbers. The second argument um, is the number of millisecond number of milliseconds between outputting a new value so this can be the same value as in our q metro uh, which in this case is 33 uh, or you can make it even smaller say every 20 seconds out, uh, 20 milliseconds output a new value this is a pretty standard arrangement line 0 20 means uh, generate lines that have floating point values and output a new value every 20 milliseconds. So the way we uh, control this is the same way as with line tilde. We give it a destination value, say 4, and an amount of time to get there, say 3 seconds. And when we send it that message, it was going to take 3 seconds to get to the value 4. And indeed it does. And if we wanted to go back down to zero in three seconds, we can send it zero, 3,000. Now it's going to take three seconds to get back down to zero. We can hook this right up to our right up to our position at Rui, and now we have control over the position of our torus. Move to the center over three seconds. Move four meters from the center over three seconds. Move back to two meters. And of course, if I want to go left of the center, those are negative values. Can move to the left of center. 
And of course, we're getting into that world of it's getting cumbersome to have all of these message boxes again. Well, there's a great new object that we're going to look at called pack. P -A uh, excuse me, we're going to look at a different one, join. Join. And join allows us to create uh, lists by putting separate values in. So if I put these two values in, I'm going to put in 1,000 and 50. And it creates the list 50, 1,000. Um, so really, to use this properly, I want a floating point value here. And this formats lists that I can then send right into my line object. So if I want it to go over the course of five seconds to location three, when I hit return, these values are going to be joined into a list and the line will understand what to do. And then if I want it to go back to location negative two over the same amount of time, I type in a negative two, hit return, and it goes. That's very handy. The The problem with this is that I can put in, I can dial in values into this right inlet all I want because join doesn't send any output until I put something into the left inlet. But I can't really dial in values into the right inlet because I'm going to get a stuttery motion. Um, so I'll show you one new feature of the floating point number box, um, which is useful in cases like this which is send value on mouse up. Send value on mouse up. With that checked, this box is not going to output its value until I release the mouse. So I can put in some time here, five seconds, and then I can dial in where I want it to go, and it's not going to go there until I let go of the mouse button. It doesn't send its value until I release the mouse button. So that's useful in situations like this. Um, the other place, and you might already see uh, that this is the case, the other place we need to use join is if we want to move our objects in anything other than the x dimension, right? Because we're sending it 2.2 and that's moving it on the x, but how do we access y and z? Well, it's another join object. In this case, it's a join 3 joining three values into a list. The first one is our x position, but the second uh, one can be our y position, the third one can be our z position. So now we're getting much more nuanced control over our objects. I can have it moving to a new x value, a new y value, and a new z value. I can have it move to location 3 over 5 seconds. If I wanted to move down, I can have it move to y minus 2 over 5 seconds. And in order to get it to output these values, because join only outputs when it receives values in the left inlet, I can use a button. I can do the same thing here. I can use a button so that when I make a change in the Z, join will actually output its contents.
The other way to do this, if you find the button methodology a little bit messy, is to set the triggers attribute of join to negative one. That will uh, cause the join object to send its output regardless of what inlet it received um, it received a change in. So then you can change these independently. So this is a way of creating simple animations in uh, Max uh, for 3D graphics. And that's as far as I'm going to go with that in this tutorial. Um, as I said, uh, make sure that you've built everything that I have here along with me uh, so that um, you can email that at the beginning of the next class meeting. And I'm going to just encapsulate this just to tidy it up so you can see a bit more what the interface might look like. Call that Animate Taurus. And each one has a destination and a time. And these are all set to send value on mouse up so that I can dial in a value and then when I release the mouse, it sends it. Uh, and I'll, I'll add one, one more thing to this, which is now that I can, with six values, animate my torus, I can use the unjoin object to take all of these and store them in a single message. So I can give my torus a whole set of instructions. I want it to go to x minus 2 in 5 seconds, y minus 1 in 3 seconds, and z minus 4 in 5 seconds. And I can take all of that, and now it's in a single button. When I click it, my torus executes that combination of moves. And I could just return it to zero in one second in all dimensions. So through this process, I've created a, an animation control system uh, that allows me to, with a single message, determine three aspects of the torus. And of course, this applies perfectly well to the rotation as well. In fact, I can just take exactly the same structure hook it up to rotate XYZ and now everything is the same except instead of positions these are now degrees of rotation. Five degrees, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, for instance. My torus is rotating. I'm going to get the cube out of the way. And I can have it rotate back to 0, 0, 0 in one second. And then again, rotate to whatever
whatever rotations I want. 25 in the x, 30 degrees in the y, 180 degrees in the z. And then return to zero. All right, that's enough for this tutorial. So just make sure that you build this. Um, I want to see at least exactly what I have. And then if you want to uh, um, continue that and expand it, you're certainly welcome to do so. Uh, and here you can see that there's even more material that I could actually encapsulate. Um, I can just take this whole thing and encapsulate it. And now we're getting an even cleaner user interface. I've created this six element list animate. If I go inside there, I see I still have my animate torus subpatcher, which now it might be worth my while to de-encapsulate so that I can see everything nice and clearly in the sub patch because of course this isn't going to create any mess for me here in fact even further I can encapsulate the join inside there encapsulate this and now I've got a very very clean interface All right. I send a six element list into my patcher six element list animate and it handles the position and since I have this patcher I can just duplicate it here and use that for handling rotation. So I hope that's useful for you. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Be sure to build this, really understand it, um, and then we'll uh, look at this uh, in more depth in the next class and expand upon it. Uh, thanks very much, and take good care.